just by way of preface, I have no affiliation with USC or any of its rivals or any of its athletic juggernauts, so we can just sort of dive in and have a nice talk. And, uh, and hopefully we'll do that. And I want to keep it loose. And if, you, if there's anything that's unclear as I'm speaking, you want to raise a hand or something, let me know. Otherwise, look forward to having a nice chat with, with Lisa and with you all at the end. Um, so my, my real introduction is this. So as Dow said, I've been covering planning in LA and California for the better part of about 10 years. And it's a fun job. I think it's an important job. It's an important subject. It touches all of our lives. And for those of you who are planning students in the room, um, you know how interesting and, and vital planning can be. Um, but as my publisher, Bill Fulton, who is a f one of the foremost planning scholars in California, um, has always said, there's no such thing as a planning emergency, meaning there is no breaking planning news. There are no, rarely scandals. Um, planning happens on a time frame somewhere between glacial and geologic. And that's fine. That's, that's the nature of the beast. Um, right now has been a really interesting time to be a planning journalist because things have happened really quickly and there's some really interesting things going on and some really, um, if I'm being not objective, and I am a human, so I'm not going to pretend to be totally balanced and objective, and Lisa's going to call me out accordingly. Um, there are some things I think are potentially distressing for the actual field of planning, um, but there are also, and there are things that actually have interesting implications for journalism and communication. So I want to lay out, as a third party observer, I am not a player in any of the things I'm talking about. I'm not a scholar. I haven't done rigorous research on this, but I've been observing it. And I'm going to try to, for everyone's benefit and mainly for provocation, try to put my finger on the pulse of what I'm seeing as these trends surrounding housing and these conflicts and um, try to give you my interpretation and lay out sort of the facts and the non-facts and see what happens. Um, so the, the, the article that Dow alluded to and the reason I'm here was an op-ed I wrote um, about six months ago in response to an article written in the website Truthout. And it was written by a journalist and a student um, whose names I'm going to mispronounce, but it's Toshio Moronek and Andrew Zedo. And they were writing about um, the IMBI movement. And there was sort of a throwaway moment in their article, but what they described was a breakfast between Sonia Trous, who is the head of SF BARF, the San Francisco Bay Area Renters Federation, and Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel, as you probably know, is a big Silicon Valley investor and founder, and not incidentally, has um, been somewhat an advisor to Donald Trump. Um, so controversial figure, interesting guy for sure. And apparently one day Peter Thiel invited Sonia to breakfast. They're both in San Francisco and Sonia accepted. And as Moronik and Zedo report, um, Sonia had the oatmeal and Peter Thiel had the quiche. And from this, we have the genesis of a conspiracy. And I'll explain what that conspiracy, according to them, um, amounts to. Sonia's mission, and presumably what they were talking about this breakfast, was the housing crisis, which Dell has already alluded to, and which many people have done research in. And I think we all know about it either firsthand or through research or you know, just through the rents we're paying and so forth. And um, what's interesting about the housing crisis is that it has obviously been going on for a very long time. It's been going on on the planning schedule. It takes many years of you know, various economic forces and planning ideas and political forces or gridlock to create and exacerbate a housing crisis. And you know, if we want to put our finger on it, it certainly goes back to the recession. When development dried up, people didn't have, you know, people had less money, they were you know, retrenching into parents' basements and roommates and so forth. So the housing crisis was, um, both exacerbated but also invisible for a while. And what's been interesting, in really, I'd say, the past two or three years, it has all of a sudden 
become labeled as a crisis. And you rarely see it referred to as anything but a crisis. I refer to it as a crisis. And it's been interesting that even though it's been going, the, the origins have been around for a while, the actual awareness and action about it has been relatively recent. Um, and what that means no matter what, no matter what the political decisions are or the economic decisions, the solution, the relief to the housing crisis, even with the recent legislation passed in Sacramento, is we know many years off. So the debates that are happening now and that, that I would say are a really new twist on planning are going to be with us for a long time. And whether they get productive or whether they get acrimonious um, in the near future, I think, is, is anyone's guess. So I'd say one, one of the hallmarks of the new housing crisis is the YIMBY movement, right? And you've heard about it before. Sonia has spoken, and I think, I think it's been referred to at several of these talks before. And the YIMBY movement's interesting. I would say it's, I would characterize it very much an open source movement. I think a lot of different people call themselves YIMBYs. YIMBY obviously stands for Yes in My Backyard. The name is a deliberate play on NIMBY, which is No in My Backyard, which is sort of the arguably offensive or at least crude term for traditional opponents of development and opponents of growth. And YIMBY sort of takes the premise that for a very long time, the opponents of growth have had a fairly loud mouthpiece. They're often homeowners groups, they're often homeowners, and therefore they vote in larger numbers. They are, they are often permanent in their neighborhoods as opposed to people who might be renters or you know, immigrants who might be transient. And for various reasons, um, people who don't like development have, have spoken fairly loudly. And the, the basic premise of Yimbyism is, well, those shouldn't be the only loud voices. There should be other loud voices. And there are people who have reason, not for political or economic reasons necessarily, although they might, but who have often humanitarian reasons, reasons of social justice, or simply self-interested reasons to advocate for more housing, to encourage cities to approve, you know, on, on a very sort of tactical level, encourage cities to approve specific projects by going to planning commission meetings and vouching for a project, by lobbying their elected officials, by speaking to planners, by going to neighborhood groups and saying, hey, this 50-unit apartment building, we think it's great, even though those two people don't think it's great. This policy to upzone an area or to, you know, liberalize a community plan. We think it's great. Those people might not. That's fine. We're going to say our thing. They're going to say their thing. And hopefully, in the political process, this gets worked out. I think that the, so that's sort of the, the very basic premise. What's cool about the Yimby movement, I think, is that there is a, in some ways, a very diverse array of characters. Um, and a diverse array of groups, some of which are very well organized. In LA, we have Abundant Housing LA. In Orange County, there's Housing for OC, or something along those lines. In the Bay Area, there are several YIMBY groups, not surprising, because the Bay Area is, I'd say, more politically active than we are. SF Barf, um, with its cheeky name, being the leader, but there are others as well. Within these groups, um, I think a lot of the members like to say that they are not necessarily ideological. They, they, they see themselves as pragmatic. Housing is a good thing. And obviously there are ideological and political issues around housing, but they basically believe that more is better for the most part. So who does that draw? That draws sort of, I would say, um, liberal hipster city dwellers who are very directly impacted by the housing crisis. Um, it, attract some interesting libertarian thinkers. Um, I went to the first YIMBY conference in Boulder last summer, and there's a dude there named Starchild. He doesn't wear clothing, and he is an avowed libertarian. He will talk to you about Ayn Rand and Hayek and whoever you want for as long as you want, and he believes it 100%, and that's great. And then there are even, um, at this very same conference, there were retiree real, uh, realtors who are just sort of frustrated by places where they see, they see their business drying up because there's no housing, so there's nothing for them to sell. Um, so, and, and I think and, you know, there, there's, a, there's a wide range. Um, is it 
ethnically and racially diverse? No. And I think well, I'll, I'll sort of talk about that some more, but I just want to put that out there that this is more or less so far kind of a middle class movement. Um, and, but, I, but that doesn't necessarily mean, or the question is, is it a movement that only reflects sort of middle class mainstream values? Um, and again, we'll talk about that further. So the MBs have, have been sort of doing their thing, and um, I think it is way too soon to say if they've been effective or not. I, they, they have definitely made themselves heard. They have definitely caused conversations. There's chatter all over the internet about, you know, on Yimby message boards and, and so forth. Um, have they, you know, caused projects to be built? I think that's going to be a, a great dissertation someday, um, hopefully sooner than later. Have they changed policies? Um, probably. I think that some of the new legislation in Sacramento, um, there's one whose number eludes me, but it has been, it was directly lobbied for by one of the MB leaders up in the Bay Area, and it, it passed. So um, on the policy front, I think that they are having an impact. Um, but of course, if the MBs want to build housing, the question is, where? And if you ask some of them, they'd say, well, everywhere. You know, we want it in literally in my backyard, if you have a house and want an accessory dwelling unit, you want it next door because you realize that the apartment building that has 10 units, why shouldn't it have 20? Why shouldn't 20 new people be able to be your neighbors and friends and you know, business partners and drinking buddies and so forth? That's what they'll say. Um, they'll certainly talk about the, um, sh should, the should, should new housing be in wealthy neighborhoods? Absolutely. If a wealthy neighborhood shouldn't be exclusionary. If wealthy neighborhoods are wealthy and real estate prices are high, that means there's a high demand for housing there. Should it be in less wealthy neighborhoods? Well, sure. If you look at LA, our poverty rate is enormous. Obviously, there are tremendous numbers of poor people, and they need housing too. Um, what are the collateral benefits? Ideally, collateral benefits might include diversity, might include equity might include, for those of you who are planning students, might include all the great things that we associate with progressive urbanism, such as density, such as ideally less driving, less GHGs, more ability to walk and bike and use public transit. Um, that's all part and parcel of density if it's, if it's done well. Um, so, you know, in some sense, this Yimby vision, it just says, all right, let's build more housing, figure out where to do it, and ideally, the, the economic argument in the very macro scale is once we have more housing, housing prices, if they don't go down, at least they will stabilize, or at least to get wonkier about it, the rate of increase of housing prices will decrease. And I think that's, at this point, probably the most we can hope for is that rents don't increase more rapidly than they're already, than they're already increasing. That's on the macro scale. It's citywide, it's regionwide, it's nationwide. If you look at sort of probably the dozen or so cities that have tremendous housing pressures, including the Bay Area, including Seattle, and Boston, New York, sort of all the, all the, the obvious suspects, which um, and demand for these cities is, of course, a function of their economic vitality and um, their attractiveness and, and all the rest. So we've got this Yimby stuff going on. But when we talk about adding housing, Obviously, we bring up the issue of gentrification and potentially of displacement. I don't see those two terms as synonymous. They are related. They have a complex relationship. What we're seeing in many neighborhoods these days, and what these guys who wrote this article, which was Savage Sonia, and I'll sort of describe, and the whole movement, I'll describe what they said. What they are basically saying is that the Yimby movement is, is essentially um, commensurate with displacement. That if you want to build new housing, you are necessarily kicking people out. And in our society, who is getting kicked out? The most vulnerable people, the poorer people, people from disadvantaged communities, underrepresented minorities, and all the rest. And they see every call for, yes, let's build this new apartment in San Francisco, let's build a new apartment in Oakland, let's build a new apartment in Boyle Heights as a direct and what they're saying is deliberate threat to those vulnerable communities. Some of the things that they've said about the Yimby movement, um, sort of 
on the, on the broadest scale, that it is essentially just a tool of capitalism, that real estate speculators and the banks and all sort of the, the usual capitalist suspects are essentially behind this movement. And they're only using it so they can get more stuff built and make more profits. Um, they're going so far as to say it is a vestige of colonialism, that when you bring new houses into, say, an ethnic neighborhood, that is colonization in a really offensive way that harkens back to you know, the, the 1500s, um, if, you, if you take their rhetoric. Um, they, you know, they, um, they, they, they certainly are propagating the idea that developers, that, that market rate developers, are greedy and craven and don't care about neighborhoods and they only see development in terms of their sort of capitalist aims. Um, what, what this leads to from their perspective is what I would say a very one-sided argument. Um, a lot of the things that, that have been, a lot of the criticism, f and, and, and I think these people identify themselves as, you know, sort of extreme left. A lot of the critics of Yimbyism identify as socialist, um, definitely identify with communities of color, um, identify with social justice movements, which are, as well they should, all really good things. But what's happening is that this sort of, this ideological fervor, when, when you stake your claim as being anti-capitalist, saying capitalism is evil, evil, evil. And if you want to say that, more power to you. I, it certainly has its evil points. When you say that development is equal to, colonize, to colonialism, what that does is that it leads to just sort of what I would call um, ranting, where you are speaking about these land use issues from this point of fervor that I think is antithetical to what planning is. And what they've done in a lot of cases is really misrepresent the MB movement. And I'll say that, I, I'm happy to say that because I know the MB movement well enough to know what they stand for. For instance, a lot of these radical left critics are saying MBs only care about, they'll, they'll take whatever housing, they don't care about displacement, they don't care about the distinction between market rate and say subsized affordable housing. They want housing, housing, housing. That's simply not true. If you look at, say, the mission statements, a lot of these organizations, they explicitly refer to the promotion of subsidized housing. They explicitly acknowledge the, the problem of displacement. And they explicitly don't advocate for projects that would displace. And yet we have radical left critics saying, essentially, that Yimbyism is pro-gentrification, pro-displacement. And that's simply not true. Um, so, where do I want to go with this? Um, so, so, what my article was about was just sort of basically picking apart this op-ed, which was presented as news. And what's interesting from a journalist's perspective is, <coughs> you read this piece in Truth Out, and it has some anecdotes. It refers to you know, individuals who've been displaced and so forth. It refers to some, <coughs> some of the campaigns by S.F. Barf. It refers to this breakfast. Um, but what it doesn't do is what journalism should do if you're, being, if you're writing news, which is be balanced. They don't talk to any urban planners in this article. They don't actually quote or interview Sonia Trous and say, hey, what are you actually up to? What do you really believe? They feel very comfortable essentially ascribing beliefs to Sonia and these other leaders of the MB movement um, under the guise of news. And they're doing so in a really derogatory way. I mean, they're not shy about their criticism, about, you know, again, assigning all these, you know, very certainly heavy labels to this movement. Um, which brings me back to this breakfast. So apparently Sonia and Peter Thiel had breakfast. These authors take this breakfast as evidence that Sonia is in cahoots with Peter Thiel over land use issues. And now, what's weird about that is we don't actually know what they said at this breakfast. I don't think that Peter Thiel has actually said anything publicly about what he believes about land use. We know what Sonia thinks, because she says it all the time. The implication, though, is that just because they sat down together 
and shared their quiche and oatmeal, that somehow it is evidence of this capitalist conspiracy and that talking to each other is inherently a bad thing. And that's what I find really um, problematic about all this, regardless of how you feel about capitalism, colonialism, and gentrification, and so forth, that the idea that communication and dialogue is a bad thing. For all we know, Sonia may have given Peter Thiel a piece of her mind. I would, certainly wouldn't put a past her. She's that kind of person. Maybe they had a knockdown, drag out fight. Maybe they didn't say anything at all. Who knows? But this article speculates about sort of the, the gravity of what that kind of meeting was. And I think that that's a microcosm of what's going on, planning, you know, you know, what can go on with these debates as they continue to ramp up in cities. My response in my piece was they had breakfast. They didn't share a room at Davos together. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to skull and bones meetings together. And that's a very different, that's a very different thing. Um, so the criticism from this radical left is that these different groups shouldn't be talking to each other. If they do, that it tars them. And one of the premises of this talk that Dowell and I discussed is that the irony of all this is that these rivalries are breaking up, are, are sort of not creating strange bedfellows, but instead creating strange enemies. Because what I would argue is that to a large extent, if you're concerned about gentrification and you're concerned about social equity and you're concerned about disruption of neighborhoods and you're concerned about the cost of just living, that many of these people on the radical left shouldn't be fighting YIMBYs, they should be aligning with YIMBYs. Because I would say that depending who you're talking to, these people have at least 50 to 90% in common. That there are alliances to be formed and interests to be identified rather than going at each other's throats. Because what I would say is that if you really want to look for an enemy, um, that's, I won't say enemy, but, but a complicating factor, it's the anti-growth, the, the traditional anti-growth people who have created a lot of these problems in the first place, both for communities of color and low incomes and for middle income working class who are just trying to like make rent without having to have three roommates that the, you know, if, if, if you're a homeowner in LA, you don't want another unit of housing built because the fewer housing units built, the more valuable your home is. That's pretty, it's understandable, it's easy, um, and there it is. And that's what the Yimbys are trying to counter. But what's interesting is now we've, now they're being, now they are being attacked from the other side. Um, and we saw it in the Measure S debate, where at, in this very room, we had, um, after the fact, the, you know, the Measure S was mainly f the, the, the slow growth measure that was in the ballot in March um, that was sponsored by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, that was largely, I would say, sort of a traditional homeowner movement, a slow growth movement with some, with some twists. To some extent, they aligned with some hardcore neighborhood activists from disadvantaged communities, <coughs> Damien, Damien Goodman being one of them who spoke here. And they align, and to me that was really weird because I see those interests as being totally divergent. Um, but for some reason, um, I think that there's a general frustration that people are trying to work out and trying to figure out how they can deal with that frustration. And sometimes it's led to these strange bedfellows and I think counterproductive um, alliances. So, um, Dal, you can cut me off any time. Let, let me sort of breeze through a few more minutes of this. Um, here, let, let me, a little bit of commentary about, I think, why this is happening. Um, wh why would, say, let's look at Boyle Heights, which I haven't mentioned yet, but it's obviously a perfect example of this, where we've seen really vitriolic protests against coffee shops and against art galleries, not even against housing, and, and, and which, which local activists see as essentially invading their local, um, their local culture, as possibly the harbingers of a rush of housing and displacement and so forth. And um, I think that, you know, what's weird is that if you're anti-capitalist and, and so forth, I think you have much better targets than like a coffee shop. You have JP Morgan, 
You have Goldman Sachs, you have Wells Fargo, you, you have the McDonald's that's across the street from the coffee shop that was so controversial. You could fight against these things, but I think what we're seeing, and I think this is a real shame, is that there's a real frustration and sense of powerlessness on the part of these communities, especially in the post-Obama era, where I think that the, wh whatever hope there may have been, um, I think some people see as being lost. And we're seeing, you know, it is, if, if you're frustrated and, and you are scared about your livelihood and your community, um, there may be a certain amount of satisfaction about lashing out against the little guy like the coffee shop when the juggernauts of the finance world that may in fact be responsible for some of this mess um, are going to go on the merry way and that are so detached um, that it's not even worth protesting them anymore. Um, so I think that's what's creating this sort of very hyper local really um, you know uh, hyper local frustrations which I think is, is actually the flip side of the proverbial homeowner who maybe has their life savings sunk into their home and is really worried about an apartment building going up next door which might reduce their property values. I think it's, it's, I think it's actually a very similar type of frustration. Um, going back though to the, 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 the breakdown of communication, um, I think what we're seeing in this debate is very much like what we're seeing nationwide, sort of the, the demise of truth and the demise of dialogue and you know, the retrenchment into political, you know, echo chambers, um, which I think we're all probably, you know, um, guilty of to some extent. But um, I think that it's, which I think is problematic in general, I think it's particularly problematic when we look at from an urban planning perspective. Because from, from a journalistic perspective, I believe in the marketplace of ideas. I want to quote different sides. I want people to have a debate in the course of the articles I write. I believe that those debates should be happening at meetings and so forth. When they are not happening, then I don't see how we make progress. And more to the point, I don't see how the forces that are in power don't simply stay in power. That is, if there's a protest against the coffee shop and the coffee shop goes under, then I guess that protest succeeded. But I don't see yet the connection between that protest and the actual social justice that these groups are going for. And I think why this is especially troubling for planning is that the field of planning for you know, all its long-term time frame that I mentioned, for all the ways that it can be very bureaucratic and very wonky and so forth, um, the beautiful thing about planning is that it is meant to be a mediating force. It is meant to moderate and mediate it's meant to look at a community and say, all right, my job as the planner is to see all of whom is here and try to figure out. And we know that Lisa has different interests, and Dallas has different interests, and Josh has different interests, and everyone does. But I, as the planner, am going to try in some ideally rational way to work that out. Um, and we have to work it out because in land use, we are all sharing the same physical space. There are other issues where I think we can agree to disagree or we can disagree and hate each other. You know, if, it, if it's abortion, if you're pro-life and I'm pro-choice and we disagree, we can go home at night and stew and, and that's that. But if we disagree about what should be on our street corner and we're walking out our door every day and we're seeing that corner and we're thinking, I want this one thing there, I want this one thing there, and it can only be one thing because you can't build two buildings on one place. And we don't have the capacity to have that dialogue and to reach compromise and understand each other, and maybe not even reach compromise, but maybe actually convince each other, then the whole um, endeavor of planning kind of falls apart and is, is hamstrung. Um, and I think that for planners themselves, I think this is an interesting moment in the culture of the planning profession, for those of you who are planning students, where I think a lot of planners do incredible jobs, but some people, I, I, in my experience, this is my professional experience, a lot of planners are um, a little bit low key. A lot of them like being bureaucrats. They like the, the detailed work they might do in their office. They don't necessarily want to get in to a huge fray in a neighborhood where people are yelling at each other. And I think that 
the new generation of planners coming up may have to reconsider sort of how they view the public discussion and the role that they want to play in the public discussion because I think that sometimes planners can play a really important role if they seize it, but often don't. And that's when some of these conversations sort of spiral out of control. And of course, the elected officials, they have their own interests and they have reasons not necessarily to take a strong stand or to be the mediator because that can be politically toxic for them. Um, so I think I want planners to be aware of, um, of what's going on and to psych themselves up, not to take sides, because I don't think that's their job necessarily, but to figure out how to help these sides get along and how to you know, fix these really intractable problems. The, I think the last, the last idea I want to end on before we chat further, um, it, which is what I see as probably the most insidious part of, of this unfortunate rhetoric that I'm seeing from the radical left, which is this. Um, if the radical left is saying, you can't build something here because it's antithetical to our neighborhood culture and so forth, to me that is a really distressing precedent. Because if you say that in Boyle Heights, you can't have a new hipster coffee shop. What if the people in Brentwood said the same thing to a coffee shop that wanted to move in, where they say, oh, you're a Latino owner of a new coffee shop. You know what? That's not right for our community. We don't want you in here. To me, that is a terrifying thought. But if that's the tactic that the, that the radical left is taking, then they essentially sanction it. And what community can't take that tactic? Um, so I think ultimately, like, that's, that's really distressing. Um, so while Lisa fiddles, who wants to, yeah? Sure, I mean, you, you drew on very Bay Area heavy sure. examples, um, and it feels like this is less polarized in Los Angeles. Do you see, aside, aside from the Boyle Heights coffee shop mm -hmm. protest, do you see uh, potential for collaboration rather than polarization? That's a good question. Um, I'm not seeing the collaboration yet, um, I'm partly because like Abundant Housing, which is the leading YIMBY group here, they're pretty new. Um, they kind of got sparked by Measure S, and they spent a lot of effort on Measure S in the first place. So I think all that is um, a work in progress. I think what's, and, and you're right, I think it's on a smaller scale here. I mean, like the Boyle Heights stuff is very, is very hyper-localized compared to what may be happening in the Bay, where like the whole city of San Francisco is really wrapped up in this. Sonia Trous is running for city council. Like that's how the city supervisor in San Francisco, that's how big this has gotten. Um, I think what's, you know, if you look at, um, what was I going to say? I think that, we'll say, I think what's interesting is that even though we're in different places, the rhetoric is really, really similar. The stuff they're saying in the Bay, the, that the radical left is saying in the Bay Area. And again, I use that term, that's my shorthand term. The stuff the radical left is saying is almost identical rhetorically to what they're saying in say Boyle Heights, which to me indicates that, you know, these are all microcosms of things that could pop up. Um, you know, I, th I think what an interesting counterpoint might be Inglewood, where the city of Inglewood is actually aggressively um, promoting development, the football stadium being the most obvious example, and it'll be interesting to see whether there is sort of a, um, a backlash to that in Inglewood. Um, so that'd be one I'd keep my eye on. But, but yeah, Boyle Heights is sort of the most visible so far. Um, Koreatown a little bit in different ways? Abundant Housing LA, um, this is the organization that he was referring to. And if you, uh, they're very active on Twitter. They have, a, they have a policy statement on their website that you can take a look at. Um, when Dell's um, title went out, I had a bunch of YIMBY people on my case on Twitter um, wanting to make sure that they were not misrepresented. And I think that's very fair. Um, but I'm actually not the person to be representing one way or the other simply because all of my research into this topic occurs in South, in South Los Angeles, right? It's in Los Angeles, it came, my research came out of a desire to understand Measure S, where it came from. Uh, Measure S in and of itself started to look at the beginning like sort of a typical homeowners movement, a typical anti-growth movement. And then people that I genuinely respect, progressive tenant organizations, um, people who have been organizing in LA for a very long time joined in that effort and I wanted to understand what they saw that I didn't see. 
Uh, so I started to undertake um, interviews. So I'm writing a case study on Measure S for a book project that I'm working on. So I'm interviewing developers, people who are on the uh, anti side, and a whole bunch of people on the pro side. And I think that I can maybe uh, fill out the radical left side, which isn't really a term that I would use. I'm sure what term I would use. I hadn't really even thought about it. But to the end of, I think Jas has done a really nice job of um, sort of fairly describing Yimby as uh, I would call it myself, having observed what's been unfolding on social media and, and in politics, kind of a, a broad-based grassroots movement uh, that has a special prominence in coastal cities in the United States um, where they, they cross-fertilize a great deal in terms of ideas and in terms of support. Um, one of the reasons why I'm so focused on Los Angeles is simply that while this movement is broad-based and has a lot of principles in common, the spatial politics differ a lot from place to place, and I think it's really hard to understand the conflicts in play unless you really understand the locations that we're talking about. And so I just don't know anything about New Jersey. I don't know very much about the Bay Area. I, I go to the opera when I go to San Francisco. I, I don't know anything about it. I haven't really lived there. So um, just with that caveat, Please take a look at the yimby.wiki, um, which is one of the websites that people directed me to so that um, you could get a handle on what uh, Yimby representing themselves um, and talking about their own stuff. Um, and they also um, have all sorts of resources on this page, including um, a whole bunch of, as you can see, press releases and news stories and things that if you're interested in the movement, you can take a look at it. Because as I said, it's always nice to let people represent themselves rather than trying to do that for them. Um, okay, so with the caveat that I am a Southern LA person, I want to talk about sort of three major points. What I think explains a little bit of the differences between these two advocacy groups that have been genuine barriers to coalition building between them. So as you pointed out, if you study the social media of both groups and you do text analysis as I have done, um, you find very similar themes, but you find them emphasized in different ways. And those different emphases are important, right? Because it's not necessarily a difference in values. It's a difference in experiences and beliefs about how the world works and about how cities work that really drives some of this. So one of the things in terms of these emphasis, in terms of scale and time frames. So I am sorry, I was raised in economics. Oh, thank you. I actually know what I think I'm supposed to say, but right, let's think about, I was raised in economics, so I'm congenitally required to draw graphs. But let's say that we have some sort of rent gradient. We know what rent gradients are because I'm going to show, I'm going to say what it is, right? A rent gradient is essentially a function that describes how rents vary over distance. So this is rent and this is distance. This could be a lot of places, right? This could be downtown. Rents go down a little bit from downtown. They kind of bloop up a little bit. When you get to places like Boyle Heights, it goes down a little bit more. Maybe there's another subcenter where the, the um, rents go up again. So one of the main focal points in the discussion amongst Yimbies <coughs> has to do with rents. And a lot of the materials and analyses pointed out online have to do with aggregate rents or aggregate regional rents. So something that's an average. Right, something that's an average. When you emphasize <coughs> supply options for trying to change rents, you're talking about a long-term phenomenon for the most part. Well, for the people who are severely housing vulnerable, they're not thinking in terms of 10 years, they're not thinking in terms of decades, they're thinking in terms of months. And so if you think, for example, about adding supply over here, it's a very good place to add supply. Right, rents are very high, and why are rents likely high? Scarcity is one problem, but it's probably high because that location is very, very productive. Right, so downtown has high rents because there's a lot of jobs within walking distance. It has really good accessibility in terms of transit and car, right? There's a lot of reasons to be down there. This one has likely a lower rent for a reason, 
right? It has less accessibility, it has fewer public goods, there are probably fewer jobs available. There's an asymmetry, right, between this place and that place. These people can do what? They can move here, can't they? If we get new supply here. Can these people move over there? There may be some margin of people who can, but they're a small margin, and that asymmetry is a big deal, especially in the short run, because if we boost supply here and make these land values more productive, it's actually possible, right, that the rents here might go up a bit. If we put the new housing here, what might actually happen? The same thing, right? When you're looking at aggregate rents, it's possible for these to go down and cause aggregate rents to go down, right? It's also possible for these to go up and for aggregate rents to go down. If we make these aggregate rents go down enough and these go up enough, you could end up in the same spot. There's all sorts of ways in which this can turn out. But for people in the short term who are relatively low skill workers, whose labor market returns have not really increased for 40 years, right? putting new productive land uses like a new office park or a new set of retail by them means that they're very likely to get outbid in the short term for what's here. So again, we're thinking about, yes, we need new supply, but we're not just supplying units, are we? We're supplying locations. And those locational differences are significant. So one of the major problems in this entire debate are these differences in scales and time frames where we're really not getting a lot of crosstalk amongst the groups about them. Now there are absolutely, right, progressive EMBs who have been housing advocates for a very long time, who simply moved restri restrictive zoning and other sort of mainstream EMB issues into their advocacy portfolio, right? But there are also, right, the libertarian, market liberal types, and with that diversity, it's great on the one hand, but it also brings up some really big questions for those outside the movement, for who really speaks for the movement. This is actually important. Because, you know, obviously, I respect people who, you know, sort of come to me and say, please don't represent our movement. We very much care about subsidized housing. Absolutely, I believe you, right? Unfortunately, there are very high profile urbanists out there who actively argue against subsidized housing. So it's great. I, I mad respect for Sonia Truss. I think she's great, and I hope she wins, because I think she'd be great. But, right, um, she's kind of Twitter famous and DMB famous. Paul Krugman is famous famous, right? <laughs> Ed Glazer is famous famous. And those are two very high profile urbanists that absolutely will not, will not say a nice thing about rent stabilization ever. And rent stabilization is really important to those people on those short timelines. Right? You don't have to have it forever. They just want to be able to keep their heads above water while all of these changes are happening. Right? So these questions about who speaks for the movement and who has power in the movement bring us to our last question and this last thing that really gets us to sort of where the divisions are. And that one that comes through a lot in my interviews is, what is different this time? You know, I understand, right, that many progressive Yimbis would like to be the folks who really represent the movement. Um, they've worked very hard, they've done a lot of organizing, there's, there's some really cool um, policy statements that you can look online, right? But it isn't just the Paul Krugmans of the world, right? If I talk about rent stabilization on my blog, I'll get, you know, 35 Twitter responses from people going, actually, Dr. Schweitzer, basic economics shows that supply will always lower demand. Now, these people may or may not be YIMBY, but it does mean that in this universe, the supply discussion is loud, and the subsidizing income supporting, right, demand side poor people helping side of the discussion is softer. And that really, really matters to these neighborhood organizers. Because what they want to be different this time around is they want us first. 
So just to give you an indicator, one of my interviewees started out in life, um, the first story she told me was that she spent two and a half hours with her mom hiding under her bed because HACLA, the Housing Authority of the city of, uh, County of Los Angeles, had sent FBI and SWAT into Jordan Downs in 2002, and there was a firefight between the gangs and the FBI. While she and her mother, she was, I believe, eight at the time, and it absolutely terrified her. Fast forward in the story. She is a single mom in her 20s. She's waited four and a half years to get a Section 8 voucher. Her number finally comes up. There's a glitch. She's told that she's going to get it, then she's told that she's not going to get it. And oh, by the way, that's the same year that there's a big scandal in the Housing Authority that shows that they have been using, that there's been a misappropriation of, of voucher funds, right? That those went to administrators and not to the program. Oh, and by the way, with that glitch, her four and a half year wait didn't count for anything. She had to get back on the waiting list at the bottom, right? So she doesn't trust anybody with the city and she doesn't trust anybody from the outside saying, yeah, yeah, I got your back. It's gonna be different this time because these are institutions that have not worked for her. I can tell you a lot of these stories from the folks that I interviewed in LA that sort of got behind Measure S because they thought it would really put the brakes on fast development. I don't really see a lot of these folks as being specifically anti-growth. They just wanna have a hand in what happens. And the, the tragedy of that in the discussion about, well, if we let people in Boyle Heights get away with it, we'll have to let people in Brentwood get away with it. Well, the bottom line is that the people in Brentwood already get away with it, right? This is one of the most exclusionary places in North America, if not the planet. And so the asymmetry already exists. So what they're trying to, you know, what I heard from a lot of these tenant advocates, uh, particularly tenants themselves, was a simple disbelief that anybody was going to deliver, anybody, no matter how well intended, right, that anybody was going to deliver benefits to them because they've been passed over again and again and again by public policy with big promises made again and again. So these freeways are gonna be awesome. Well, they weren't awesome for South LA. We have people who are old enough to remember that. The blue line is gonna be awesome. It's gonna completely revitalize South LA. Yeah, the blue line is a very nice train and it provides a lot of mobility, but it hasn't revitalized South LA. Oh, we're gonna do a consent decree with the LAPD and everything's gonna change. It hasn't changed. That, whether that's fair or not for YMB folks to grapple with is another question, but that's the reality of the folks who are approaching these conflicts. And I don't think it does to ignore that. You have to understand what has happened in a place if you want to build that coalition. And I think for them, the real key isn't vocalizing the right values. It's not showing the right sort of progressive empathies. It's delivering on the us first. A lot of them think that's what's gonna happen is that the developers are gonna get what they want and the Yimby folks, since they just want housing supply, they're not necessarily being fair when they say that, but the Yimby folks will be like, yay, score, we got a development done, and they'll walk off. And once again, their benefits are gonna come during phase two, during the trickle-down portion of tonight's uh, program, during the filtering part, how long does that take, right? When you're always phase two and the promised benefits never arrive, there are very good reasons why you wanna be first, right? And I have yet to see anyone really grapple with that on the EMB side. And I would also say that there is plenty of vitriol thrown out of the EMB side. I have been called every name in the book, right, by experts, armchair experts who need to explain my field to me, even though the stuff they want to explain to me is the stuff I cover the first two weeks in my freshman class. Um, recently, just recently, and the person who did this is my favorite, one of my favorite people in the world, right? Just recently, there was circulating a, an, an, an article where the title was, it's the vacancy rate, comma, stupid. Now, y'all are millennials, so maybe you can explain to me if that's some sort of cool millennial way of making friends. But when you publish that kind of stuff, it makes people angry. It makes them feel talked down to. And oh, by the way, this particular article had empirical claims that are actually fairly easy to refute by somebody like me. So there's plenty of this stuff going around. And that's politics, right? That's politics. 
politics often gets vituperative. And that's the last thing that I would encourage my planners in particular to leave with. So one of my early mentors in practice, when I was having a very bad day, um, a particular community had given me a really rough time over something that was really minor, but they just rolled me all over the place, so mad. And he said, you know, would you feel better if people didn't care about where they lived? Yeah, it would be easier if you had no opposition. Your life would be better, right? But you didn't get into this job because you wanted an easy life. He actually gravely mistook me because that's actually why I wanted the job. But <laughs> would we really be happier if people never fought for the places that they loved? Yes, there are people who are being exclusionary. Yes, there are people who are being selfish. But yes, there are people out there who genuinely love the places that they live. They've grown up there. Their identities have been formed there. And I think if you approach that with anything less than radical respect, you are making a mistake as a planner. How did the Great Recession impact all this? We, we, construction has been delayed for many, many years because of the recession. It's now recovering, that backlog, the downturn in the economy, the frustration by everybody. How much difference did that make? And what do we do to deal with something of that magnitude? From an urbanist perspective, the best thing that happened with the recession was actually curtailed some of the sprawl development, which has its own problems. You can love it or hate it, but it's not, you know, um, so that's sort of on the supply side, that's what the recession did. Um, coming out of the recession, a lot of people have a lot more money now. And we have sort of a middle class and, a, and a, you know, the millennial class that now has the money to pay higher rents and because they want to be here, they popped out of their parents' basements and are able to pay 3,000 bucks a month for a one bedroom in a way they wouldn't have eight years ago. So I think that's sort of, that's the sort of thing we might not have been able to anticipate. That's my quick answer. I don't really know, honestly. I think there's a lot of different answers to that. One of the things I would point out is that I think there are actually housing crises and not just a housing crisis. I think they're a different mm -hmm. segment of all these housing markets. And there's been a group of people who have been housing vulnerable ever since I was your age, which was about 490 years ago, right? I mean, there have always been people on the bottom of this market that have moved in and out of homelessness, even when there was more slack, a little more a slack in the market than now. And so those folks have, have had especially difficult challenges, but then moving into that group are people who are suffering because there are supply constraints, right? And people who really haven't seen their home prices bounce back very much, and a whole bunch of people in South LA who lost their homes to foreclosures. And so the, the foreclosure crisis in Los Angeles was not a one thing, right? Uh, West LA, its land values bounced back very quickly. In South LA, they, they haven't bounced as much. They've, they've recovered to some degree, but a lot of the folks who were owners at the time are not really there to see that recovery because there were so many foreclosures there. And I think that's a pretty significant thing. I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer. That's something that I would really need to sit down and think. So how much is this about process? And I'm not too familiar with what's happening up north. Um, I'm from the Central Valley, so I kind of think of what's happening there and the process they went through with their general plan and downtown plan. Mm -hmm. And then I look at Boyle Heights. And how much is this about ignoring a process because of basically it's a renter community and economic class that makes up that area? I mean, is it triggering a specific plan for the area and opening it up to the community? I think of extreme examples like the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, mm -hmm. where it was a completely, it was a fight, but it was a community-driven process where they took eminent domain and they led housing development, they led commercial district development, a very slow and long process, and nobody ever wants to do that. But how much is it but about- it was a nice process. It was, yeah, and nobody has been able to duplicate it, but how much is this about process and class? Um, I, mean, I mean, I'll jump in. I mean, I would say that I don't know where the Boyle Heights Community Plan is in its revising, but I mean, everyone admits in LA the process is broken, right? Like, the community plans are all outdated or don't mean anything. We've got some new ones, we'll see how they go. Um, but under our zoning community plans, we can negotiate, right? Like, we've got a plan, but then it says, okay, city council and planning commission, if you wanna make an exception, you're allowed to. So therefore, you do it. And, you have to have that exception or else, because you can't write a perfect plan. My point about the planners was that as these community plans get updated, I hope that the planners are able 
to listen to these voices and, and interpret them in a productive way and mediate and not just write a plan that says, okay, the locals don't want anything new and the MBs or the MBs want all this stuff and they can really use that process. I don't know how that's going to turn out. You know, that, that really depends on how good a job the LA Department of City Planning does. You know, so, so we'll see. Hopefully this will be, you know, catalytic. I, I have an answer to that too, simply because what really shocked me when talking to the folks around Measure S was how much it had to do with process. How much they really wanted to, to throw some elbows in order to make people get vested in updating those community plans so that there's a systematic vision for upzoning in a way that keeps them from being targeted necessarily, but also that spreads around the idea that we have new housing units that we need and that all of these other places have to take their fair share right along with us. I think that one of the, the perceptions uh, among the people who supported Measure S was simply that, you know, you pay enough, it, the pay to play was a very big theme in the media. It was circulated a lot in their own internal materials and they really felt like it was a way that they advantaged specific developers and really hurt nonprofit developers. How much has the phrase public housing been on these activists and groups' minds? Because I understand with the Jordan Downs story that you told that that's incredibly negative. So, and obviously HACLA and other organizations throughout the country have but Hakla is going, undergoing a really nice renovation at Jordan Downs. It's not the place that it was, right? These places don't always have to have a negative stigma. I mean, there's some nice stuff going on by Jordan Downs. But it's the, as the perception of, amongst people who are, you know, for fair housing or for, for affordable housing, or is public housing entered their conversations at all at any level, whether it's with YIMBY or whether it's with pro-S groups or any, or any sort of group at all? Um, I think that it's fair to say that there are people in the YIMB movement who very much talk about subsidized units. They talk about vouchers. It's, public housing is much less supported simply because I think they rightly note that there's a really strong stigma attached with public housing in the United States. But I also think that there's a lot of misunderstanding of housing subsidies. You know, we subsidize housing a lot in the United States. We just do it for relatively wealthy people through tax expenditure programs like the home mortgage interest deduction. Um, which probably does help some people on the margin of home ownership, but the vast majority of the benefits go to relatively affluent people. Um, I do want to I do want to finish one thing though before I go is that one of the real problems here is that people don't recognize the amount of subsidy and the amount of public housing in a lot of places that they compare us to around the world. So they'll compare us to places like Tokyo or Vienna or London. Singapore, and those places have very active, one, they have very active social welfare policies, more generally, as in they can actually reply, rely on having universal health care from day to day, and they have very strong public housing programs. I, I, this is a quip and it's not very fair, but a lot of people love European cities, but they hate their socialism. And you can't just cut those two things off from each other. Sorry. So two, two quick things. One is, usually when we talk about public housing, that's usually a federal program. So in some sense, that's sort of out of the fray. Second is, um, look at Santa Monica, where they've downzoned their plan. And, and the, 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 the opponents in Santa Monica say, we love housing as long as it's 100% affordable. Well, that's great. But unless you have the money, the subsidy, the nonprofit developer who's going to build 100% a, a, a building with 100% affordable units, you're not going to get it built. So that's just a way to, to, to nicely say we don't want housing and still seem, you know, humane about it. I grew up in the Bay Area. I'm from Oakland. I live in Pasadena. Some I own of my property. favorite cities. <laughs> I love I own property in Phoenix. And um, I go to church at Los Angeles here in South LA. So I'm Good seeing this, yeah, <laughs> and I'm seeing this crisis in all of these different places. And I wanted to ask um, how it seemed to me as I go from city to city and we visit and travel and do what we need to do. Why? Why did Berkeley work? <laughs> Berkeley kind of worked. Um, you have. Because um, I see, I see. Uh, Berkeley is one of the favorite online YMB whipping boys. I, and I don't know enough about Berkeley to be able to say when, whether they're right or wrong. What do you think works about Berkeley? Well, I do know that they have rent control there in Berkeley. And a lot of people, I have friends when I was growing up that lived in San Francisco. And when the prices got too high in San Francisco, they had the option at the time of Oakland or Berkeley. Um, and those who moved to Berkeley are still in their homes. Those who moved to Oakland are not. They're displaced. 
Um, and I understand the phenomenon as I go and I visit, but it's just interesting to me because whether or not you're high income or low income, you can live in Berkeley. So, and the city seems to be progressing. It doesn't seem like Berkeley's like this most awful, you know. I think the, com I think the complaints has to do with the fact that Berkeley hasn't really allowed that much new housing. Yeah, Berkeley's a lot like Santa Monica. Okay. You know, yeah, I mean, it looks great. It's, it's awesome. It's great if you're in, mm -hmm. but if you're not in, um, whereas Oakland has sort of been taken over by this, you know, wave of new residents in a much more dramatic way. Back for the planners. What I think about this issue is planning is really good at excluding and separating. To a large extent, that's what planning was invented for, for zoning. You can do this here and this there. And the easiest thing to do is to say no and to say, you stay there, you stay there. I think the challenge for planning going forward that all of this represents this plan's got to figure out a way to, I know it sounds cheesy, but to be a uniter and not a divider and to figure out how to take those planning tools, again, zoning being the most crude, and figure out how to make it equitable and progressive and so forth. And I think that's one of the sort of structural problems that's allowed this to, this to happen. My final thought. Well, from a planning theory perspective, I think we may, might lead on this thought is there's absolutely no consensus in the profession about what the role sure. of local determination should sure. be, right? What rights should neighborhoods have, right? Or, and, and should they have, there's the right to shelter on the one hand, there's the right to inclusion, there's the right to opportunity, yeah. but there's also rights to free association, which are very important for communities of color. There are rights to have a, a voice in your local government. And the question are, and planning itself has never really taken a definitive stance on, mm -hmm. we're gonna support higher levels of government in forcing people to include, or we're really gonna side with communities as they seek their own self-determination. That's a really big question to leave unanswered. And I'm, a, I'm gonna leave it unanswered because I wanna go. All right, <laughs> thank you.